Well, was it hot out there today? That's what I, that's what I heard the weatherman say. So, anyway, where are we, what are we doing here? 1 Peter chapter 3, that's where I want you to do, that's where we're going to start. And it's good to see everybody here tonight. I hope that if you're in a bad mood, that being in God's house puts you in a good mood. And I hope you're, if, in a, if you're in a good mood, being in God's house does not put you in a bad mood. Amen. So, 1 Peter chapter 3, and um, we're going to look at a few more things about baptism, and then I'm going to kind of show you, what is it that I'm going to, I'm going to try to show you a little bit of the universe. All right, just a little glimpse of the universe that God made and what baptism signifies concerning the universe. All right, you think, does it have anything to do with it? I think it does. So let's look in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse, we'll pick it up, verse 18, read down to the end. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Um, I was talking about this the other day, Romans 7, and there's other places like this right here that give you the understanding of the separation between your soul and your flesh. Your flesh is going to burn when this earth burns. Amen? It's going to rot in the grave. It's not going to heaven. It's, it's, it's not leaving this planet, all right? But you're, the new man that is in you, that's what, that's what goes to heaven. And that's what he's getting at here in verse 18, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. My old man, the flesh waxes older day by day, but the inward man, the Bible says, is renewed day by day. So while the old man gets older, the new man never stops getting new. It's renewed every day. I like that. So then verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism, doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Father, we ask your blessings tonight as we open up your word. We pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would open up the word to our ears, open it up to our eyes, open it up to our understanding and to our hearts. And Father, Lord, may we be filled with knowledge and understanding. May we be filled with the grace of wisdom tonight. Lord, maybe experiences, maybe things we've already been through, Lord, will be made alive and real by your word. Or, Father, maybe the word will prepare somebody for things that they haven't gone through yet. But, Lord, you'll, re you'll remind them of the scriptures that they learned. And I just pray that you'd bless your word. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Uh, question number one, does water baptism save you? No. Okay. Question number two. So I'm kind of going back on some what we've already studied on this so far. So question number one, water baptism does not save you. Number two, can you be water baptized without being saved? Yes. Number three, can you be Holy Ghost baptized without being saved? Okay. Number four, can you be saved without receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit? No. You cannot be. Salvation comes when God enters your heart. Amen. God the Father, because 
in Jesus is all the Godhead bodily. When we receive of the Holy Spirit, we are receiving the Spirit of God's Son in us. And that's how we know we're saved. It cries, Abba, Father. God is no longer some angry, distant entity that's billions and billions and billions and billions of light years away. He's no longer that way to us. He's as near to us as our heart, as the Word of God, as our prayer time, because He lives on us in the form of the Spirit of His Son, Jesus Christ. So, y'all have done well. Consider yourself dismissed if you want. Roy, not you. You hang around till after class, all right? All right, now, uh, I have up on the screen there, uh, we, we covered uh, two weeks ago, we weren't here last Wednesday night, but a couple weeks ago, we covered the idea of the difference between water baptism and Holy Ghost baptism. There, and there's several more verses that I didn't get into. But let's pick it up here tonight. Acts chapter 8, verse 13. You should have already had your Bible turned there. But if you don't, I will give you 1.8 seconds. Okay, done. Acts eight thirteen, And I have written up there, salvation followed by baptism and that is water baptism salvation must always come first and again can we baptize little children that have not been saved is it okay to baptize them i mean it does no harm but it does no good does no good number one they'll never remember that number two what faith did they even have to be baptized to begin with. How did Christ enter into them and, ba and save them when they do not, do not even know the difference between sin, righteousness, heaven, hell? The shame of nakedness does not appear on them yet. So Acts chapter 8 verse 13. Then Simon himself believed also and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So Simon believes first. Just like later on in this same chapter, the Ethiopian eunuch believes first. He asks, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So believe first, then the uh, administration of water baptism. Uh, by the way, I'm going to throw you something. I'm not, I, I don't think I've covered this. Uh, but I'm going to ask you a question. Does water baptism have to be administered by a bishop of a church? Who says no? Who says yes? The answer is no. There's actually nothing. There is actually nothing in the scriptures that indicates water baptism must be performed in a church baptistry. There's nothing that indicates in the scripture that it must be performed by a bishop or pastor of a church. It could be done by a deacon. It could be done by an elder. In fact, I don't know that there are specific rules on who can administer water baptism in the church i know of no prohibitions i know of no certain restrictions i i would say a little bit of common sense is involved here i wouldn't ask liam to baptize anybody in the church i just wouldn't do it okay i don't think i would ask sister pam to baptize anybody in this, she wouldn't do it. Okay, but I don't. I don't think I could. I don't think I could do that. I think. I think common sense would tell us that the bishops, the deacons, the elders, the elder men of the church could do this. But besides that, that there's not any uh, any restrictions. Acts chapter ten, verse forty-seven. A couple chapters later, this is um, in Acts. This is Peter. In Cornelius' house, remember Cornelius was the first of the Gentiles to believe God giving him the vision 
of Peter, God giving Peter the vision of Cornelius, God leading Peter to Cornelius' house. Peter, Cornelius opens the door. Lo and behold, it's Peter. Peter's looking there at Cornelius, and they're going, hey, God gave me a vision. And so that's how that whole deal worked out. But once Peter then preaches the gospel and they believe, then in Acts chapter 10, verse 47, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. So a couple things here. Number one, when the house of Cornelius was saved, they received the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. The washing of the Holy Spirit. They received that right then. It was not, it was not something that waited for Benny Hinn to come into town. It was not something that waited for the revival to happen. It wasn't something that happened some months down the road. This happened with them the night that they believed the Holy Ghost came into them, gave them the sign of they all spoke with tongues and they prophesied. And so now the question is, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? The only thing about Acts chapter 10 that's brought up later on in Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Council is they noted that none of these people in Cornelius' house was circumcised. They noted that, that Corne neither Cornelius nor anybody in his house was told, well, okay, you're safe, you know, but we need to circumcise you because that's the law. Law says you have to be that way before you can receive baptism, before you can receive the Holy Ghost. None of that was happening. That's what was brought up in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council was they noted that here's the Gentiles being saved, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and they didn't follow the law. So that was the Holy Ghost signifying to the church that men are saved without the works of the law. Can I hear God's people say amen? Acts chapter 11, turn there. Acts chapter 11. We're just kind of following in the course of the book of Acts. Letting the Spirit guide us, letting the Scriptures lead us. Acts chapter 11, verse 12. The Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Now I will say... Water baptism doesn't save you, but words will. Words. What words? The words of the Holy Ghost. It's the word of God that saves men's souls. I'll never forget. I was talking about this yesterday. Uh, I met a real life giant. His name was Max Palmer. And he was 7 foot 11 inches tall, was in the Guinness Book of World Record for being one of the tallest living men. He had, he bought a pickup truck, one of those, we used to call them king cabs back then, that's what they were called. Because what he did was, he took the front seat and put it in the back of the truck so he could drive that truck. 7 feet 11, is almost 8 feet tall this man was. Okay. And he was in, I've actually looked him up, Internet Movie Database. Uh, he was in some of these really cheap 1950s monster movies. And uh, he was a professional wrestler, so he had money, he had women, he had a lot of whiskey. And he was just living it up and enjoying life so well that he was going to kill himself. So he checked into this dirty, cheap motel with a pistol and a bottle of whiskey sitting on the edge of the bed, and he reached over to grab either the whiskey bottle or the pistol, I can't remember, but his hand laid on that Gideon Bible because back then they used to keep them on top and not hide them. And when he opened up that Gideon Bible, the words that were in that book saved that man's soul. Right in that, right in that hotel room, saved that man's, he read John 3.16, never heard it before. And he got down on his big old tall knees beside that bed, you can imagine, it's kind of like him knelt over a towel on the floor, okay? <laughs> Big old guy kneeling over that little bed in that hotel room and asked Jesus into his heart to save him. And he went around the country, built himself as a giant for the Lord, went around preaching everywhere he would go, telling his testimony of how God saved him. He used 
what God had given him, which was his size, to evangelize people. But his story was incredible. But it was the word of God that saved him. So anyway, verse 15. And as I begin to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them. Notice that. Because Paul then asked in Galatians 3, when he says, Who hath bewitched you, O foolish Galatians? This I, I'm going to ask you, received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And the answer is by the hearing of faith. So these people, as Peter's preaching the gospel, they are believing it and the Holy Ghost fell on them. And then Peter is saying, as on us at the beginning, he's talking about the day of Pentecost. And he said, then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? So the Holy Ghost fell on them as they were hearing the word of God, meaning that they were Holy Ghost baptized in that house, washed by the water of the word of God then they were water baptized but salvation and Holy Ghost entrance Holy Ghost baptism are always at the same time then water baptism to follow Acts chapter 16 turn there Acts chapter 16 verse 14 And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple. What do you think that means? She's selling crayons or paint? A seller of purple. Who said dyes? That's pretty good. They didn't make dyes in factories. Okay? That people, however you make certain dyes, some of them come from... The minerals in the ground, some of them come from plants or whatever. But whatever, she, either she made dyes or she made purple cloth, which was very popular. Uh, but that was her trade. That was what she did. She was the seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, uh, which worship God heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. Well, that's very important right there. And, and I, I'll say this to you. And to those of you online, you're trying to convince loved ones, you're trying to convince family members, you're trying to get them to listen to what you've got to say concerning salvation, concerning the gospel, concerning the Bible. And I, I don't give up. Please don't give up. But if God, God is the one who opens and shuts. Jesus is the one. Whether that's the door of the ark, whether that's the gates of hell, or whether it's somebody's understanding or their heart, Jesus is the one who opens or shuts it. In the case of the book, Jesus is the only one who can open the book or who closes the book. He's the only one that has the right to do that and that can do that. So when it comes to people that you're laboring with, people that you're trying to reach, people that you're trying to talk to, Pray for them, witness to them, but understand there is no magic word that just saves people. There is no magic word or phrase to where they'll believe the Bible. There's, there's nothing like that. If God doesn't open up their mind and their heart, they're not going to heaven. That's the, that's the end of it right there. Now, God is sovereign. God is wiser than we are. And God knows Whose heart to open and whose not heart not to open. God, what did God do with Pharaoh in the days of Moses? He hardened his heart. Clearly, and God had a purpose in that. It was to reveal God's glory. So he brings Pharaoh over to trap Israel so that God could perform his miracle of opening up the Red Sea. Had he not brought Pharaoh over there, Israel would be content to just stay there on the beach, but they had to be pushed. Sometimes you've got to be pushed, amen? But then God opened up the water. Who can do that? Only God can. And only God can open up a person's heart, all right? 
So anyway, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Verse 15, and when she was baptized. So what happens first? Her heart is opened. Then she's baptized, water baptized here. And her household, she besought us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So again, the Bible's giving you clear example. The heart is open first. The Holy Ghost comes in. People believe. People are saved when the Holy Ghost comes in, when the Holy Ghost baptizes them, when the Holy Ghost uh, washes them clean and their conscience clean by the water, by the word of God. Then water baptism is, is brought about in that person's life. But it's not before, it's not water baptism is the salvation. The Bible does not anywhere in any place indicate water baptism being the saving method of God or what actually washes your sins away. It's never mentioned that way in the scriptures, ever. Uh, 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen. let me just read this very quickly and then we're going to change subject. For by one spirit are we all baptized. So everybody that is a member of the body of Christ, everybody that is saved, everybody that is born again, everybody that is sealed by the Holy Ghost, they are baptized by one Spirit. All of us are into one body, whether we be Jews or... And is there a difference? Do, do, do Jews get a different baptism than the Gentiles do? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. They don't have a different gospel. They don't have a different baptism. There's not a different church that they should go to, a different ritual that they should have. It, it's God is no respect of persons when it comes to salvation. And so whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, Christ died one salvation for all, both Jew and Gentile. Whether we be bond or free and have been made all to drink into one Spirit. And by the way, that spirit does not make you drunk when you drink it. Does not. And let me just ask you this. How do you drink the spirit? Read that book. Read that book. Your soul is doing with the word of God what is required. And that is you, it, you are feeding your soul. Just as you feed and nourish your body with water and with food, you do likewise your soul with the word of God. It is the food, it is the body of Christ, it is the drink, it is the blood of Christ. And that goes to our soul. So, uh, Pam and I were having a deep theological discussion, the difference between transubstantiation and consubstantiation. What's the difference? Right? Because con means with. Okay? So transubstantiation is, in the Catholic Church, that cookie turns literally into a piece of the flesh of Jesus. And if you've ever seen a Catholic priest uh, with that wafer in his hand, he is extremely careful with it. Because any crumb, they, they believe that any crumb that comes off of that, that's Jesus' body wasted out into the world. And that's, that's an abomination. A lot of Lutheran churches believe in consubstantiation. That that's not, it doesn't... Um, turn into the physical piece of meat of Jesus' body. But Jesus' body accompanies that wafer. So whether it's transubstantiation or consubstantiation, it is still the idea that you are being saved by eating and drinking with the mouth and with the stomach. And that is not Scripture. It's not scripture. That's not salvation. Both of them are wrong, whether they're trans or cons. They're both conning you, okay? They're both wrong. So, so you drink the spirit. 
reading the Word of God. You eat the body of Christ by reading the Word of God. And then Galatians 3.27, For as many as of you have, as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Water baptism. When you're water baptized, the first thing a person does when they get out of the baptistry is they towel it off. Well, you just washed Christ off of you then. According to that idea, if water baptism is putting on Christ, then you just toweled him off when you got out of the baptistry and you dripped him all over the floor. How dare you? Okay. So, I mean, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. And again, I'm going to reiterate this. There is not one thing in this world that is a requirement that accompanies our salvation. Nothing in this world is our salvation hinged to, attached to, fixed to, nailed to, tied to, chained to, nothing. Our salvation is in heaven, comes from heaven, is associated with heaven. It's not associated with any one thing on this earth, including communion, including water baptism, including any ritual or rite or laying on of hands or anything. It is not accompanied with or by anything in this world. And I am glad of that. Because what if you can't get to it? What if it can't be brought to you? What if you can't get to the church? What if you can't go to Mecca? What if you can't make it to Jerusalem? Well, then you're stuck. You have no salvation. God doesn't hinge it. Heaven will come to you. Amen. I just thought of that. That's pretty good. Amen. All right. Now, turn to Genesis 1. This I call baptism as a prophecy. Baptism as a prophecy. We're going to... Get a little understanding of the universe that God created. By the way, I'm doing a Watchman broadcast. I recorded part two today on the number 10. If you look in Genesis 1, J.R. Callie, do this. Count the number of words in Genesis 1, verse 1. Go! How come she beat you? She's just sitting there with this smug smile, Ken. Got you, brother. They're like Donnie and Marie, I'm telling you, okay? <laughs> Ten. Ten words. And look at that verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Ten is a number for dominion. God created the heaven and the earth. God owns the heaven and earth. God rules heaven and earth. Heaven is God's throne. The earth is his footstool. Anything that's under your feet, you own it. Okay? Okay? <laughs> And so, ten words in Genesis. This is a King James Bible. This Bible's perfect. I'm telling you, this Bible's perfect. Every word, don't add nothing to it. Don't take away anything from it. Amen? But here's what I want to teach you. Genesis 1-6. Okay? This is, this is how God made the universe. He created the heaven and the earth. But everything is void. It's misshapen. The earth was without form and void, uh, nothing in it. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. So on the first day, we have light and the division of light and darkness. So now, on day two, God is going to start adding form. To the universe that he's created. He's going to start putting barriers in place. So in verse 6 he said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. Okay? And so verse 7, God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament. From the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven in the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, we have, according to Scripture, we have three places that the Bible calls heaven. The first place, he says it in 
20, we have fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So the first heaven, he calls it the open firmament, meaning it is an expanse of sky. It is an open area, and yet it is a firmament. So in that first heaven, the fowls of the air fly around. They have wings, and they have the light bone structure, and they have feathers, and that enables them to... It's, it's amazing still to watch a hawk or an eagle just... Float. Just stay up there using the breezes, using the drafts, okay? So that's the first heaven. And we see, we're able to see with our eyes what God meant in verse 6 and 7 when he said we're going to divide the waters from the waters. On here, down here, there's water. Up there, there's water. And that water is divided from this water, right? And that water, and how, how heavy did you say water was? Eight pounds per gallon. That's heavy. So you're carrying five gallons, you're carrying a five gallon bucket of water, you're carrying 40 pounds, one hand, that's heavy. You're carrying two of them, you're carrying 80 pounds, that's heavy, okay? Back when I was, had some guns here, I could carry four buckets at a time. Don't laugh, I could. You want me to show you? Let's go back in time 25 years and I'll show you what I could do. Now think about that. The water that's in a cloud. How much water is in a, your average cloud? Hundreds of gallons. How, how much does that weigh? Tons. What's holding it up? The firmament that God divided the waters from the waters. It's actually air pressure. That's what creates the firmament. And God's a genius. How he does this with no planks, no boards, no two-by-fours, no iron beams or nothing. That he holds in a, in a thunderhead. If you've ever seen a thunder cloud in the distance, a thunderstorm. We was looking at one the other day, yeah, last night. There was a big thunderhead up there. Those th there's more energy in a thunderhead than there is in an atomic bomb. And there's more water in those things than you can shake a stick at. We're talking about thousands upon thousands upon thousands of tons of water being held up in a firmament called air pressure. God's amazing. Okay? So he's given us a picture of what this firmament is. And this is all, this is all part of baptism. Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting there, but I've got to explain the science to you. So let's go up one level. We have the, we have the heaven surrounding the earth that the, that the birds fly in. The second heaven is outer space. So, between the, on the earth there's water, and then in the first heaven there's water, and it's divided by the firmament. So then we have the second heaven. So below that second heaven is water, which is the water that's above our heads in the sky. Follow me so far? On the other side of that heaven, into the third heaven, there is another water. Separating the water below the firmament from the water above the firmament. The water below outer space is what we see in the clouds. And then the water that separates the universe from heaven, we can't see, but we know it's there. Because that's what God said. He put it there. He put a barrier of water between the edge of the universe. We have no idea where that is. We can't tell it. We can look with our telescopes, looking into the, as far as our... Telescopes can see billions and billions and billions of light years away. And, and the astronomers and the scientists even speculate 
that beyond the farthest limit that we can see is the rest of the universe that we can't see and we have no idea how big that is. So let's say that we could only see like this far into space and where the, where the edge of the universe is, is like between here and that ceiling up there. I mean, it's huge. And I believe that because God said, as, as high as the heaven is above the earth, that's how high my ways are above your ways. We'll never figure God out. Amen? But we know that separating the universe from the third heaven where God is, is water. Take your Bible, turn to Revelation 4. Because John saw it. John saw it, Ezekiel saw it. Job heard about it. It's there. John chapter, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. I love that one. That one sitting. I know who that is. Now Revelation 4, 6. Before the throne there was a sea, an ocean of glass like unto crystal. So it was glass it was like glass in that it was clear but it was watery like a sea okay so it was glass in that you could see through it but it wasn't impenetrable because it was a sea you can penetrate water okay so a sea of glass, like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So now turn to Ezekiel 1. Turn there. And then we're going to, this is what baptism is telling us. Water baptism. Ezekiel chapter 1, this, you know, Ezekiel got to see the throne of God. John got to see the thing. Now, here's a, it, there's always a difference between the Old and New Testament. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel gets to see the throne of God because it's brought down to him. In the New Testament, John gets to see the throne of God because he's caught up to it. Okay? That's the difference between your Old and New Testament. Old, New, Old Testament, God had to come down here. New Testament, we're going up there. Okay? So in Ezekiel 1, verse 21... He's talking about the four living creatures and their wheels. This is the chariot of God. When those went, talking about the wheels, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible what? Crystal. What did John see? The crystal. Stretched forth over their heads above it. And he called it the firmament. But he's also referencing it as the crystal. John gives us another look at it and says it's a sea of glass clear as crystal. So we have the idea that it is transparent, but that it is like water. Okay? Now look at verse 26. And he calls it the firmament. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. As the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Who's that man? That's Jesus. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about it. And as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face. So would you. Amen. And I heard a voice of one that spake. So we're, we're, what are we getting? This, we're getting this idea. There's water here on the earth. We even know that there's water beneath the water that's on the earth. 
Then there's water above the water on the earth, and that's separated by a firmament. And they're, they're just separating the water up here from the water down here. But then, between that water and the edge of the universe, there is another water, clear as crystal, a sea of glass, clear as crystal, and above that is the throne of God. This is how Job described it. Job 37, you want, want to turn there. Look and underline this verse and, and maybe make references to Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 4. Job, in Job 37, verse 18, Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong, and as a molten looking glass? Molten, why? Why did he say it was molten? Because it was liquid. The sea of glass in heaven is liquid glass. And Job says, as, as molten looking glass. Because even water, a looking glass is a mirror. Even water reflects image, right? So that's what we're seeing here. And Paul referenced this, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. So, between us and the moon, there's a firmament of water. Between the moon and God, there's another firmament of water separating. Before we can go to heaven, we've got to come through the water. Does that make sense now? I mean, I, I spent a lot of time giving you the science of it. But the Bible's right. The Bible's telling you that between us and God is a sea or a river. Okay, so now in Exodus 14, and I'm, I'm just, I'm finishing up here. Exodus 14, the Lord said unto Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward, but lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the what? Of the sea. What's up? below God's throne a sea before we can get from here to the promised land God has to make a way through the sea and that's what water that's why we're not baptized in dirt amen we don't go out in a sand pit cover everybody up with sand and then bring them out of that it's water. God knew what he was doing. God is showing you the science. God is showing you how he created everything. So you're laying down here, but between you and where your eternal life is going to be is water. And you've got to come through the water to get there. And we, we, we've been singing these songs for years. I, you know, uh, on Jordan stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye. Okay? We, in order to get to the promised land, we've got to cross... Jordan. Okay, so and I've got the verses here, but Joshua, before he leads Israel in the promised land, they have to cross Jordan River. Uh, there it is, Joshua 3, 2 Kings 2, before Elijah is translated into heaven, him and Elisha have to cross the Jordan River. God signifying unto us that between us and heaven, Water separates us, and only God can open up the way for us to get to the promised land through the water. Water baptism. Okay? So, that can only show what God has already done and what God will do. God will open up the way through the sea so that we can get from here to there.
Amen. All right, so now you are, I'm going to tell you this. You are smarter than all of the physicists, the geologists, the astrophysicists, the astronomers in the entire world. You're even smarter than Albert Einstein himself because you believe the Bible and you believe that little teaching about the waters and the firmament and the seas. And we're never going to get to heaven until God opens up the way for us to get there. And I'm not kidding you. You are smarter because you believe the Bible than all of the scientists in the whole world. Okay? Tell God thank you.